During the past three days, it has been my privilege to appear on a number of television shows. I've also had the privilege of meeting and talking with a great number of people from coast to coast, in hotels, on airplanes, in Hollywood film studios, in the studios of the three major networks. Last night, just before I went to sleep, I began to think about those various conversations. It seemed that there was one theme that ran through all of them. The theme was salvation and the new birth. I've had more people in the last two weeks ask me how to be saved, what does it mean to be born again, or to tell me their own sometimes weird experiences in seeking God than any two weeks in many years. For example, as we were coming across the country the other day on an airliner, the stewardesses and some of the people gathered around to ask questions about their own personal relationship with God. The Bible teaches that Satan deceives the whole world. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus also foretold that many false prophets will rise and shall deceive many. Paul also sounded the alarm that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Apostle John had to warn even in the first century of many antichrists. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Peter also warned, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Today, there are many false prophets misleading people to a wrong entrance and to a wrong gate to the kingdom of God. Many of these were expressed to me in these conversations during the past couple weeks. Many of them had, had many weird ideas as to how to be saved. Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Time after time during the past two weeks, I've told people how they can find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In going deeper into the matter with them, I find that the great problem is commitment. One university professor told me of his own inward struggle in moral, spiritual, and intellectual issues. He said, More and more I've come to realize that my problem with Christianity is really not intellectual at all. It is moral. I've not been willing to meet the moral requirements of Jesus Christ. And then he asked this question, What can I do to receive Jesus Christ? The other night, the governor of one of our states called me on the phone. He seemed to be struggling with his emotions, but finally he said to me, I'm at the end of my rope. I need God. Can you tell me how to find God? Tomorrow night, I will be speaking at one of the great federal prisons in the United States. I remember visiting a group of men on death row in a prison some years ago. A strong and intelligent looking man listened to what I had to say. Then I asked the men if they would be willing to kneel down while I prayed. Just before we knelt there, the man said, Can you explain once again what I must do to be forgiven of my sin? I want to know that I'm going to heaven. These are precisely the same questions asked of Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. They are the same questions asked of the apostles as they proclaimed the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. The questions indicate that man's inward spiritual longings have changed very little in these hundreds of years. The rich young ruler came running to kneel before Christ and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? After Peter preached his great sermon at Pentecost, the people were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, What shall we do? The African nobleman, riding in his chariot across the desert, talked with Philip the evangelist. Suddenly the nobleman stopped his chariot and said, What doth hinder me? At midnight the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now 20th century man asked the same question that man has always asked. It is just as relevant today as it was in the past. Just what must one do to be reconciled to God? What does the Bible mean by such words as conversion, repentance, and faith? I know that you've heard it over and over again. But even though I've been a Christian nearly 40 years, I like to hear it explained over and over and over again. These are all salvation words, but so little understood by the masses of people. Jesus made everything so simple and we've made it so complicated. He spoke to the people in short sentences and everyday words, illustrating his messages with never-to-be-forgotten stories. Today, the devil would like us to use high-sounding phrases, to invent new terminologies, to use words that people cannot really understand. 
when the Corinthian jailer asked the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave him a very simple answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is so simple that millions stumble over it. The one and only choice by which you can be converted is your choice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't have to straighten out your life first. You don't have to make things right at home or in your business first. You don't have to try to give up some habit that is keeping you from God. You've tried all that and failed many times. In our crusades, when I give the invitation to receive Christ, we sing the hymn entitled, Just As I Am. And you come to Christ just as you are. The blind man came as he was. The leper came as he was. Mary Magdalene with seven devils came as she was. The thief on the cross came as he was. You can come to Christ just as you are right now. The word conversion means simply turning. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, God pleads with men to turn to him. However, it is impossible for man to turn to God, to repent, or even to believe without God's help. All you can do is call upon God to turn you. Many times in the Bible it is recorded that men did that very thing. When a man calls upon God, he is giving true repentance and faith. That is why the Apostle Paul could say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible never asked man to justify himself, to regenerate himself, to convert himself, or to save himself. God alone can do these things. There are at least two elements in conversion, repentance and faith. Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repentance carries with it a recognition of sin involving personal guilt and defilement before God. It does not mean a cringing self-contempt. It is a simple recognition of what we are. We see ourselves as God sees us, and we say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Job said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repentance also means a change of feeling. This means a genuine sorrow for sin committed against God. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance means also a change of purpose, and carries with it the idea of an inward turning from sin by the exercise of the will. However, all you have to do is to be willing. And then if you are willing, God will help you in your conversion and in your repentance. Repentance is the launching pad where the soul is set on its eternal orbit with God at the center of the ark. When our hearts are bowed as low as they can get, and we truly acknowledge and forsake our sins, then God takes over. And like the second stage of a rocket, he lifts us toward his kingdom. The way up is down. Man got into difficulty when he lifted his will against God. He gets out of trouble when he bows to the divine superiority. When he repents and says humbly, God be merciful to me a sinner, then man's extremity becomes God's opportunity. Now the second element in conversion is faith. In order to be converted, you must make a choice. The scripture says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now who is it that is not condemned? It is he that believes. And who is condemned already? It is he that does not believe. Then what must you do in order to be not condemned? The answer is simple. You must believe. Now, of course, we must understand what that word believe implies. It means commit and surrender. The Bible teaches that without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Believing is your response to God's offer of mercy, love, and forgiveness. God took the initiative. Salvation is all of God. When Christ bowed his head on the cross and said, It is finished, he meant just that. God's plan for our reconciliation and redemption was completed in his Son. However, man must respond by receiving and trusting. 
the most obvious thing about saving faith is that it believes something or someone. It does not believe everything or just anything. It is belief in a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Neither is faith antagonistic to reason or knowledge. Faith is not anti-intellectual. Leighton Ford has said, Belief is not faith without evidence, but commitment without reservation. Belief involves the intellect. Desire involves the emotions. Commitment involves the will. Thus, the whole man is involved in an act of proper faith. Faith is actually what we know, how we feel, and what we do about Jesus Christ. Thus, faith becomes action, and the action is faith as commitment. With some persons, there may be in conversion an emotional crisis, the symptoms of which are similar to those of mental conflict. There may be deep feeling, an outward outburst of tears and anxiety, and yet there may be none of those things. There are those who experience little of any emotion. They accept salvation without any particular crisis of mind or emotion. They cannot in fact specify any definite time when they first entered into their knowledge of Christ. When Jesus described the new birth, to intellectual dignified Nicodemus. He said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus said it was like the movement of the wind, which sometimes is as quiet as a light breeze, and at other times as revolutionary as a hurricane like David or Frederick that hit the coast. Conversion is like that too, sometimes quiet and tender, sometimes uprooting and rearranging the lives under great emotional manifestation. There is also the act of the will in conversion. This is actually a volitional resolution. People can pass through mental conflicts and emotional crises without being converted. Not until they exercise their prerogative as a free moral agent and will to be converted are they actually converted. This act of the will is an act of acceptance and commitment. They willingly accept God's mercy and receive God's Son and then commit themselves to do God's will. In every true conversion, the will of man comes into line with the will of God. Almost the last word of the Bible is this invitation. And whosoever will, let him take up the water of life freely. It is up to you. You must will to be saved. It is God's will but it must also become your will. I'm going to ask you to receive Jesus Christ right now by repentance and faith. Will you do it today? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many that have been listening will be convicted by the Holy Spirit and will repent of their sins and turn to Christ as Savior. For we ask it in His name. Amen. Next Thursday night, we go on television from coast to coast for three consecutive evenings at prime time. You can find the exact time in your area through announcements in the newspapers and television guide. This will be the most extensive television coverage we have ever had. This time, we will have nearly 300 stations, and with the exception of only two cities where we cannot purchase television time, almost every American will have the opportunity of hearing the gospel. On Thursday night, I will speak on the subject, Can America Be Saved? On Friday night, the subject will be, The Coming Storm. On Saturday night, I will speak on, The Frustrations of Youth. It is our hope that Christians everywhere will not only pray, but use these telecasts as an evangelistic opportunity to win thousands to Jesus Christ. Many Christians are planning to invite their friends and neighbors to view the telecast with them. When the telecast is over, they have a marvelous opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ. I believe that every Christian in America has a responsibility this next weekend to help us touch the nation for Christ at this critical hour of history. As you have already heard, today we have the final service of the Denver Crusade. We believe that this is the beginning of a spiritual awakening in this great western state of Colorado. Almost every service to Bear Stadium, seating 25,000, has been filled to capacity. And on some evenings, hundreds have been sitting on the hillsides around the stadium. On one evening, nearly 75% of the audience of 31,000 were under 25 years of age. When I gave the invitation that night to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, over 1,800 people came down in front of the platform to indicate their commitment to Jesus Christ. 
our entire team has sensed a spiritual hunger and witnessed a ready response to Christ in Colorado. The prayers of thousands of Christians throughout the world are being answered as the entire state has felt the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This week, my new book, World of Flame, goes on sale in bookstores throughout the nation. It took me nearly two years to write this book. I've prayed more, worked harder, and put more into this book than any book I've ever written. It tells in strong language the diagnosis of the world's troubles and the biblical answer. The last 75 pages of the book deal with the prophecies concerning the end of the world. World of Flame is an evangelistic book, and it is my prayer that it will be used to win thousands of people to Christ Jesus throughout the world. You can get this book at almost any bookstore across the nation this week. On this weekend, while Americans are enjoying their last holiday of the summer, new crises are building up as the world moves from the frying pan into the fire. Red China is again threatening India. Pakistan and India are in a virtual state of war. Our longtime ally Greece is experiencing serious internal upheaval as the left wing makes a desperate bid for power. This little spaceship called Earth is beset with violence, woes, anguish, and hatred as it tries to work out its problems without the help of God. Jesus once said, all days of the beginning are sorrow. Trouble and turmoil are characteristic of the human race as God's finger writes out the final decrees for a world which has forsaken his laws, trampled his mercy under its feet, and ignored the sacrifice of his son upon the cross. Abruptions among young people are expected in many parts of the nation. Other young people in various parts of the world have been rioting this past week in such faraway places as South Korea and even in Sweden where the people have social security from the cradle to the grave. Everywhere there's a dissatisfaction with the status quo. Something is wrong. The great question this weekend is, what is wrong? Where did we miss the boat? In the book of Genesis, there's the story of the building of the Tower of Babel. It was one of man's first efforts to achieve, to succeed, to build a better world without God. The story of the building of this famous tower is related in the 11th chapter of Genesis. In verse 1, it would seem that early in history, man had achieved an objective which men today are striving for in vain. The Bible says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. The race problem did not exist then. Language barriers were unknown. Mankind had a unity of oneness which is unknown in the Babel of our time. It would seem that with unity of language, unity of race, and unity of purpose, that they would have built a utopia which would have been a heaven on earth. But the Bible says that they failed completely and miserably. The mistakes of Babel are also the mistakes of our modern society. First, the people of Babel tried to build a society without God. The Bible says, and they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. The key to their first mistake is found in the words, Let us. This same let us is characteristic of our society today. We, like the people of Babel, are trying to shift for ourselves. Christ, the unifier of men, Christ, the Prince of Peace, Christ, the essence of love and understanding, is excluded from our national and international discussions and deliberations. We talk glibly of one world, of the World Security Council, of world peace, but the very one who can give individuals love, understanding, security, and peace is overlooked and ignored. The press reported this week that the Soviet Union has formally and firmly slammed the door on any hopes for an agreement in the near future on stopping the further spread of nuclear weapons. In other words, the Geneva Conference has utterly failed to reach an arms agreement. It has failed just like the United Nations has failed in its efforts to stop the spread of nuclear weapons and solve the basic problems of our world. Why have these great attempts failed? They failed because we have said, let us go and build, and we have said it while ignoring God. There's nothing wrong with working for a just and a lasting peace. However, the sin of it, the wrong of it, is trying to get the right thing in the wrong way. Man was created as a working partner with God, and the Bible says, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. When we defect from 
in God's way, when we try to erect our towers in opposition to his plan and will, we're headed for Babel, confusion, destruction, and judgment. There was nothing wrong in building a tower. There's nothing in the Bible to indicate that God is opposed to progress. But the basic philosophy of the people of Babel was wrong in that they tried to build by leaving out the master builder and creator God. This is what modern materialism and secularism are doing in our day. We're trying to build a new social order while leaving God out. This past week, as the governor of Colorado walked across the field with me after the service, he said, This meeting indicates that people are thirsty for something that materialism is not supplying. High white governor Lloyd Wiles, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Let us go to him, let us. This is the modern act called ancient Babylon. And any effort of man when God is left out of the picture ends in confusion and chaos. The second mistake of Babel was that they tried to reach heaven without the God of heaven. Let us build us a city whose top may reach unto heaven, they said. Man has always tried to manufacture a utopia. Babel was his first vain attempt to do so. Socrates, Aristotle, and a thousand other ambitious men in history have tried to fashion this sin-cursed world into a heaven on earth. In my new book, World Aflame, that I mentioned a moment ago, I have a chapter entitled, The Fabulous Future. In this chapter, I show that nearly every American president of recent years has had a slogan to characterize the objectives of his administration. All of these slogans have held out to the people new hope and anticipation of a better life tomorrow. With President Roosevelt, it was the New Deal. With President Truman, it was the Fair Deal. With President Kennedy, it was the New Frontier. And with President Johnson, it is the Great Society. The planning for this fabulous future, however, has one fatal flaw. It is materialistic, secularistic, and humanistic. It does not take into account man's moral sickness, and it has made little provision for God. Today, man eats continually of the tree of knowledge without partaking of the tree of life and lives still under the satanic delusion that he will become like God. Science is learning to control everything but man. We have not yet solved the problems of hate, lust, greed, and prejudice which produce social injustice, racial strife, and ultimately war. Thus, this utopia is threatened by many dangers, such as the nuclear destruction that hangs like the sword of Damocles over our heads. God had made a heaven for man to live in in the Garden of Eden. It was a genuine heaven on earth. Man lived peacefully with the animals by day and communed with God when the shadows lengthened in the evening. But in the midst of this dazzling splendor rose the ghastly sect of sin. And when man saw the beauty and joys of Eden for one fleeting moment of disobedience, he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. He had traded his garden for a grave. Sin always fashions the grave. Today, man is a long way from the Garden of Eden. In fact, his future is the grave. The only thing any man born in sin can permanently look forward to is a grave. The Bible says, what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a time and then vanisheth away. Man can build his towers as did the people of Babel around the edge of his grave. He can build his universities on the edge of his grave. He can formulate his proposals for peace on the edge of his grave. He can compose his symphonies on the edge of the grave. He can paint his masterpieces, sing his songs, write his great books on the edge of his grave. But he can't escape the grave. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, the Bible says. The Bible teaches that we've been thrown out of Eden because of our sins. We try to get back a thousand different ways, but the Bible teaches that all of our human efforts not only have failed, but will fail in the future because we have not taken Jesus Christ into consideration. In the story of Babel, there is the amazing statement, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. He was not an invited guest. They built it without his consent and without his counsel. But God knew what they were doing, and he had them under surveillance. This leads us to the conviction that God is concerned with what is going on in the world today. He is not blind, deaf, and dumb to the world situation. The Bible says his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. He knows of our plans. He is cognizant of our schemes. He sees our frustrations and failures. 
The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. He is still interested in this little planet called the earth. He is still involved and will be until his plans for us are completed. God judged the human race because of the building of the Tower of Babel. And the Bible says that God confounded their language and scattered them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. In other words, Babel became a judgment. Babel is an example to our world today. God's judgment for Babel was confusion and dispersion. And so long as we try to build a better world without God, it will become worse. So long as we try to build a more peaceful world without the giver of peace, wars will increase. God has a plan for this world, and if we would fit into that plan, we would find peace. The Bible teaches that God is preparing a new Eden for all of those who trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. But there is only one door to this new Eden which is called heaven in the Bible, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the door. There is only one way to peace, and that is through Him who said, My peace I give unto you. There is only one way to God, and that is through Him who said, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I ask you today to walk through that door to receive Christ as your Savior, as we've seen thousands here in Colorado this past week, and put our, and put our confidence and faith in Him, because we have been promised eternal life if we receive him as our Savior. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. It is my privilege to write a daily newspaper column for over a hundred newspapers. It is a little question and answer column in which I try to prayerfully answer the questions that are sent to us. One of the most frequent questions asked by our readers is, how can I find happiness? This question takes various forms and is expressed in many ways, but basically millions are asking the same question. At first glance it would seem that this is a selfish question. Rather it would seem we should ask, how can we make others happy? It has been proved that in helping others, you find happiness. You can find happiness yourself by helping other people. Some time ago, a lady wrote and told of her despondency. She said, I'm elderly. My husband is dead, and my children are all married. I've lost interest in life. And after talking with her about her relationship with God, I suggested that she look around at other people who have more reason to be unhappy than herself. Start helping these people. Find happiness, and you will find happiness yourself. I received a letter from her several months later stating that she was busier and happier than at any time in her life, that in helping others, she had found a new way to personal enjoyment. However, Christ did promise happiness to the individual in his teaching. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, he used the word blessed eight times. This word actually means to be happy, highly favored, or enjoyment. In fact, many modern translations have substituted the word happy for blessed. Christ taught that happiness is not a state of mind which depends on happenings or circumstances. In fact, it is not a state of mind at all, but rather it is an attitude of the heart. Jesus, for example, during his earthly life on earth, had every reason to be unhappy. He came into his own, his own received him not. The foxes had their holes and the birds of the air had their nests, but the Son of God had not where to lay his head. He was falsely accused, endured the ordeal of a mock trial, and was unjustly nailed to a cross until he was dead. But the rough treatment accorded him did not once ruffle the dignity of his soul nor disturb his spiritual equilibrium. The Bible puts it this way, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. We know that happiness in this life is a possibility regardless of circumstances because Jesus demonstrated it. Over and over again, he encouraged the faint-hearted to be of good cheer. Those words, so often spoken, become a sort of theme song of his career. They brought forgiveness to the sinner, power to the weak, and hope to the lonely and fearful. The Bible teaches that you are entitled to happiness. Life need not be an empty, idle dream or an evasive will of this illusion. God didn't put you into this world to float aimlessly across the sea of time, only to fall purposely into the abyss of eternity. Your soul was made for soaring, not for sighing. Your heart was made for singing, not for sobbing. That word blessed was spoken not only to that remote multitude in the whole country of Galilee 2,000 years ago. It was intended for people of all ages, races, and cultures. Yes, this year of 1955 for you. Who 
is happiness does not mean that we go skipping through life singing tra la la boom today. It is not always possible to pack up your troubles in a low kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Life at its best is a rather sober business. Nothing develops into a thing of beauty without coping with pain, blight, and hardship. Roses grow out of a bush of thorns. Lilies bore their way up through the mud and slime of their native environment. Sunshine is the product of anguish, clouds, winds, and elements. Out of chaos emerges loveliness in this exquisite beauty. Even those who may be lying on a hospital bed at this moment are going through some other intense mental or physical suffering. You can be happy. Happiness does not depend on circumstances. If you make serenity and happiness depend on outward circumstances, then you are destined to disappointment and dissolution. In fact, many times a person does not find true peace and happiness until in the midst of suffering and pain. I have a friend in Charlotte, North Carolina, who was paralyzed a few years ago from the neck down. She testifies that she never knew genuine peace and happiness and joy until through her experience she met God. The birds of the air, the flowers of the field, and the animals of the forest are immune from the world, the threats, and the frustrations common to man because they invariably fulfill their purpose and destiny. Man cannot do this without help because unfortunately he is a victim of an impediment called sin. If he had never sinned, all would have been well with him. He too would have fulfilled his high purpose unmolested. But at the very outset of his history, man stumbled and fell. And like a herd of sheep, when the leader plunges over a precipice, the rest of the generations have quite naturally fallen into the same faithful abyss. But the good news is that despite this awful tragedy, a way has been provided for man to rise out of his environment, out of his slough of despondency. Two thousand years ago, an emissary came from heaven as a goodwill ambassador from the glory. In a few short years upon this planet, he did some very wonderful things, the last of which was to lay down his life, thus performing the last act of atoning sacrifice, which reconciled man to God. From that day to this, all men who reach to have found the real happiness which God intended for man to have all the time. Before this man came to the world, there was very little the human race could do about their unhappiness. But today it is different. If you're unhappy, it is your own fault. Not God's, nor Adam's, nor anyone else's, but yours. Because in the book of Proverbs, I find a receipt for happiness. I would like to share it with you. We have sought in vain for this serenity of soul. These verses were written by Solomon, who had acquired great riches, had attained great knowledge, and had gained great fame. But none of these things in themselves had brought him happiness. First, Solomon said, Whosoever trusted in the Lord, happy is he. The reason many people object to religion is because the only religion they know about is a religion which doesn't work. However, the Bible is one of the greatest how-to-do-it books in the world. One of its great themes throughout is the secret of how to be blessed and happy. Solomon had tried everything to find happiness. Power and influence did not make him happy. Riches did not make him happy. Wisdom did not make him happy. Drink did not make him happy. Sex did not make him happy. He looked at the world round about him and said, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Then he said, The only true happiness is found in trusting in God. Many of you listening to my voice today have been missing the rounds. Your life is filled with drudgery and monotony. Others of you are filled with conflicts, inner strife and tension. You long for even a moment's joy and an hour of peace. Sometimes it seems that peace of soul is almost within your grasp and then it is gone. The old conflicts and doubts come back with even greater force. But Solomon had a prescription for all of this. It was medicine for the soul. He said, I've tried it all and found that by trusting God, I have an inward peace and happiness. This word trust means to have faith in or to surrender. It means to surrender yourself completely and unreservedly to Christ as Savior, Lord and Master. It means that you hold nothing back and cast yourself completely upon Him for salvation. It means that you come to the cross, confess your sins, and by faith receive Christ as your Savior. When this happens to you, you become born again. You experience a rebirth. And when this rebirth takes place, you have found the secret of life and it boosts upon your soul with all the joy and happiness that you have ever known. The Bible teaches that when Christ is simply received and implicitly trusted, a new life begins in the soul of man. You can start all over today by receiving Christ as your Savior. The second ingredient of happiness is found in Proverbs 14.21. He that hath mercy on the poor 
Happy is he? Now happiness is not a selfish thing to be hoarded. It is a secret to be shared. Our wealth to be divided with others. There are two kinds of poor that we are to share with. Those that are poor materially and those that are poor spiritually. There are thousands of people living in comfortable homes and driving expensive automobiles who are far more poverty stricken than the most destitute in our slums. They are rich materially but poor spiritually. I know many people who have little of this world's goods but they are spiritual millionaires. They have peace, joy, happiness, and when you meet them, there is a glad handshake and a ready smile. They are free from nervous tension and worry. Money cannot buy this type of peace. It comes as a gift from God after you've trusted His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that we find a certain happiness in ministering to the materially and spiritually poor. Many of us ease our conscience at Christmas by carrying a package of food to an needy family or participating in a white Christmas service. But this is not enough. We are to be constantly concerned about things we have really learned about us. To give a few dollars to charity and call it helping the poor is hypocrisy. We Christians have a social responsibility to those round about us. And Christ promised that a cup of cold water given in his name would have its reward. And certainly one of the rewards of, is having compassion on the poor is happiness. We are also to have compassion on the spiritually poor. The spiritually poor are those who do not have peace with God. They have never known the peace of Christ. They have never had the load of sin lifted. They have never been born again. They may be rich, cultured, and artistic, but unless they have Christ, they are poor. They need help. They need you as a Christian to go to speak to them concerning Christ. How long has it been since you won a soul to Jesus Christ? How long has it been since you shared with the spiritually poor? All the minus of the poor and needy, but too often we, like the monks of old, lock up our Christianity behind musty moldy walls and fail utterly to share the thrill of Christian experience with others. Christ likened the gospel to seed. Seed is not to be hoarded. It is to be broadcast, to be sown, and to be shared. Jesus, after the resurrection, found his disciples behind closed doors. They, like us, were inclined to hold the precious seed of the gospel, but he wanted them to march, to go, to preach, and to sow the seeds of the gospel to all nations. They did. Fears were dispelled. Old superstitions melted away. Hatred gave way to understanding and love, and the world experienced their own birth. How are we to recover the joy which the old Christians need? I'll tell you how. By sharing our services, our means, and our living faith with the needy poor of the world around us. He that has mercy on the poor, happy is he, said Solomon. Solomon's third ingredient of happiness is found in Proverbs 29, 18. He that keepeth the law, happy is he. These words suggest the great fact of human freedom. A man who lives in the hills near me expressed his freedom in these words. I go where I want to go, stay as long as I want to stay, and leave when I get ready. To him, that is freedom. But freedom can get you in trouble if it isn't used properly. If you release a child on the sidewalk near a busy thoroughfare, he may use his freedom to cause his destruction. In freedom, there is both life and death. In many ways, it is dangerous to be free. God knew this. So in love and compassion, he laid down some laws. He put up some red and green lights on the thoroughfare of life. These were instigated not to limit or restrict man, but as guideposts to happiness, peace, and contentment. If God had made man like the animals who behave in a prescribed manner, instinctively, there would never have been any such thing as moral character or human dignity. God wanted man to choose the right, but man was capable of choosing either right or wrong. If he had been created any other way, he could never have been crowned with glory and honor. Many people are concerned about the lawlessness in the world, but have never done anything about the lawlessness of their own hearts. The secret of happiness is obedience, yieldedness, and compliance with the will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be happy, Solomon said one of the best ways is to obey the laws of God. But it is impossible for you to obey the law. You cannot keep the Ten Commandments. You cannot live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You've tried a thousand times, but you failed. That's it. You must acknowledge your failure. You must acknowledge your transgressions. You must acknowledge that you've sinned against God. And when you do that, you've taken your first step toward the kingdom of God and your first step toward genuine happiness and joy. Acknowledge your failure. Acknowledge your sins. Then by faith we see Christ as your Savior. And then you will have a new law written upon your heart. And here we encounter the need of the new birth. You need to be born again. 
at Calvary. It was as though God was saying, I had to give you freedom of choice to make you men. And to prove that you had this freedom, you had to experiment with it. Then I heard God say, but I will share with you in your blunder. I will move heaven and earth to give you a new start. So he sent his son to reconcile us and redeem us. You obey the law, then not out of fear, but because of the reciprocal love which God has placed in your heart. And like a good, well-adjusted son, you obey because instinctively you have it in your heart to please your father. And because there is harmony between you and God, there is peace in your heart. You are happy. Conflicts have ceased. And all is right with the world. There are thousands of you listening to me that have searched for happiness all your life. You have looked for joy and peace and contentment all your life. And you never found it. I beg of you to receive Christ today. I beg of you to put your hand by faith in His hand and begin a life of inward happiness and peace. I do not mean that there is no trouble ahead. I do not mean that there will not be disappointments and persecutions ahead. But I mean that in the midst of troubles and difficulties there can be peace with God that will bring an inward happiness. You can be happy today by giving your life to Christ. During this past week, we've received hundreds and thousands of letters from all over the world telling us that people are praying for the New York Crusade. Things happen when Christians pray and obey the Word of God. No city has ever been able to withstand an earnest prayer assault, a united Christian offensive, and an unhindered barrage of simple gospel preaching. Jericho fell when the people of God marched in spiritual unison. Nineveh fell before the faithful witness of a single man who was obedient to the heavenly vision. God gave John Knox the heart of a whole country when in compassion he prayed, Give me Scotland or I die. What we're witnessing in New York is God's response to human intercession. It is a living fulfillment of the scripture that says, The fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. The chain of prayer, which has been in the process of being forged this past year in hundreds of areas around the world, is becoming probably the greatest prayer chain in history. Typical of the letters we have received are these two from churches in Egypt and Mexico. From Alexandria, Egypt comes this word. The Youth Fellowship and the church here are praying for the success of your crusade in New York City. Each morning at 7 o'clock our people gather for prayer expressly for this campaign. May God's richest blessings and the power of the Holy Spirit give you strength. From Mexico City comes word of fervent prayer in that area. We would like to let you know that here in Mexico City, there are scores of people which are lifting you and your team up in prayer before the Lord. We meet regularly every Tuesday for a whole day of prayer, and sometimes for a whole week. Please be assured of our wholehearted prayer support. Yes, a mighty wall of prayer encircles this great metropolis, and as a result, the slain of the Lord are many. Do not Christ say that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven? Literally millions across the world are in agreement that this sophisticated, complex, strategic city shall experience a spiritual awakening. God is beginning to answer their prayers. Because you have prayed, we can say with Moses' conquering host, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God hath delivered all unto us. Yes, the battle is God's. The methods are his. The message is his. The strength is his. The victory is his. The glory is his. The Lord our God is in the process of breaking down many walls of spiritual indifference in New York City. We could fill this hour of decision with cold statistics which are indicative of God's working in this densely populated area. We could speak of the more than half a million who have been in attendance. We could speak of over 19,000 who have come to the inquiry room for counseling. We could speak of the thousands who are seeing the telecast here in New York each night and the additional millions who see it on Saturday night. But today, I would like to share with you a few of the personal experiences of people whose lives have been changed by the power of Christ in answer to your prayers. First, Last Tuesday night, an extremely attractive young professional dancer who recently appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show joined the hundreds who accepted Christ. Her interest was aroused through our late television program, Impact, on which many converted celebrities have been appearing, testifying as to how Christ changed their lives. She now testifies that she is radiantly happy and now has an inner joy, and she is eager to share her Savior with her family and friends. Second... 
A college student from York, Pennsylvania writes, During this past week, I was graduated from college. The culmination of my education plus the prospects of a successful future should have been a high water mark in my life. Instead, I was depressed because of the pointless clamor of society and the many philosophies which are thrown at us. Tonight, I heard your message. I have come to realize that joy is to be found only with God. I have received Christ and will earnestly strive to follow wherever he may lead. Thirdly, we received word from a top businessman who was viewing the Saturday evening telecast with some of his business associates. Though some of his friends watched the service with detached curiosity, the Spirit of God was driving the truth home to his heart. At the close of the program, when the invitation was made, to the surprise of his associates, he dropped to his knees, asked God to forgive him for his past life, and accepted Christ in the presence of his friends. Fourthly, Many teenagers are accepting Christ and are waiting us that their problems and frustrations are being resolved in Him. Typical of the letters is the following. I'm just coming into teenage, the most difficult age of life. But it's the best for me because I have found Christ. I'm a happy girl now. Real joy inside of me and my whole life has changed. Before, I was like all teenagers. I had bad thoughts about people and always liked to strike back. But now I can tell the world that I don't have to fear about getting into trouble anymore. To find God, I had to leave all those bad habits behind with the devil's works. Pray that I may become stronger in the Lord. Fifthly, from many parts of the world, men and women with a burning hunger for God are converging on Madison Square Garden. We have 295 foreign-speaking counselors who can speak 32 different foreign languages, and we have materials in 37 different foreign languages to place in the hands of those who are coming to accept Christ. From far away Italy this past week came a man, and he was the former chauffeur for Mussolini an avid race car fan and a driver of race cars himself. He had lived an adventuresome, exciting life, but down deep inside was an aching void that the world's thrills could not satisfy. He said, I've searched in many lands for peace, but have not found it. I now yield my life to Christ. He said the other night, I'm the happiest man in New York. Sixthly, Many people of God's chosen race have made their way to the counseling room to accept Christ. One of these was a keen, upright, respected businessman who had heard the gospel in our Los Angeles crusade seven years ago and for seven years had rebelled against the idea of accepting Christ. All this time, however, he was searching for the truth. He read in the Bible where Moses gathered the people to him and announced that he was dying and that God would provide a prophet to carry on. As he sat in Madison Square Garden one night, the whole the Holy Spirit convinced him that Christ was a God and the Savior of the world. When the invitation was given, he said, I could hardly wait to get down the aisle to accept Christ. Seventhly, we've been asking you to become a participant in the crusade by visiting New York and sharing in the outpoured blessings of God in this area. The following testimony shows how Christians can use the crusade as a springboard for soul winning. On May 27th, I came to New York on my vacation, hoping to attend the meetings and see a bit of the city. After the first night, I was fully convinced as a Christian that I should be in attendance every evening as well as the Bible hour in the mornings. The afternoons were spent in my hotel room praying for the crusade. The second day in the big city, I called a very dear friend of mine and invited her to dinner in the crusade. Though reared in a fine home, she had drifted far from God. She had not been in church for 15 years. That night as the choir was singing, Just As I Am, I whispered to my friend, Perhaps this is for you. She gave a deep sigh of relief and said, How did you know I wanted to come? When I called her the next day, she said she had a peace and a joy she'd never known. She said even the leaves on the trees looked Greener. Eighthly, the daughter of a French diplomat at the United Nations writes, I know there are thousands of souls won to Christ already, and there will be thousands more, but I want to assure you, Mr. Graham, without being presumptuous, that there could not be one more completely and surely won to our Lord and Savior than I am. I made my decision for Christ in the third service of the crusade, and I feel as though my heart has wings. These are only a few of the hundreds and thousands of testimonies that pour into the crusade office daily. I wish we had time to give the details of the young actor who was 
up on a Hollywood contract, but turned it down because he didn't want to miss any of the crusade meetings. I wish we could tell you the thrilling story of the man who was converted to Christ and set out to witness to every family in his apartment house and how seven of those people have already made decisions for Christ. I could, wish I could tell you about the pastor that told us this past week that last Sunday he received into the membership of his church 54 people. What a glorious experience that was for that pastor who had a very small church. But time forbids. We've reached a crucial point in the New York crusade. There is grave danger that we may become overly confident. Though great victories have been obtained, we dare not rest on the oars. Literally millions of people in this great city have not yet attended the meetings. We have barely scratched the surface. We need your prayers now more than at any time. We need to pray as we have never prayed before. I want to strongly urge all of our prayer partners to double your prayer efforts. If you have been praying 30 minutes a day, double that to an hour. Spiritual awakenings are not only started by prayer, they are perpetuated by prayer. The final offensive of this crusade must be made on our knees. The secret of the victories of the early church were found in these words. They continued with one accord with prayer and fasting. There are some encouraging signs that this crusade could focus a spiritual awakening in our land. Two pastors wrote this week from distant states saying that after visiting the crusades and giving the report to their people, their congregations were strangely moved and many people were moved to accept Christ. One said that at the close of his report of the crusade, 14 people stepped out to profess their faith in Christ. Let us join hearts and hands all across America in a spiritual unity and in concerted prayer that our nation may experience a tidal wave of spiritual revival. This could be our last opportunity before the catastrophes of a hydrogen bomb age. You can help most by your earnest prayers. You can encourage us by letting us know by your letters that you're standing with us in these days. You can help by writing your friends and acquaintances in this city, asking them to come. We have many instances of conversions because of letters that some of you have written to New York people urging them to attend the crusade. And then there are many of you listening to my voice today that are not in Christ. I challenge you to take him as your Savior. You haven't really lived until you find him who is the way, the truth, and the life. There are many of you listening today that do not realize that Christ died on the cross for you. That if you had been the only person in the world, he would have died and shed his blood for you. That your sins might be forgiven. That you might be transformed and changed. At this moment... You can receive Christ. You have not come to Madison Square Garden. Perhaps you cannot come to Madison Square Garden, but you can receive the same Christ. The Bible tells us that Christ is omnipresent. He is everywhere in the world at the same time. He can speak to you as he is speaking to thousands of people here at Madison Square Garden night after night. I'm going to ask you to receive him, to give your life to him, to trust him as your Lord and Savior. Many of you will ask, what do I have to do? I'm going to ask you at this moment to bow your head, close your eyes, and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I receive thee as my Lord and Savior, Master. I trust thee. I'm going to follow thee from now on as my Savior in the fellowship of his church. If you will pray a simple prayer like that, your life can be changed. Your sins can be forgiven. You can know the peace and the joy that these hundreds and thousands of people have found here at Madison Square Garden. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thy Holy Spirit shall bring many to the cross across America and throughout the world. And we pray that many will say yes to the same Savior that so many here in the garden are saying yes to these nights. We pray that thou wouldst bless Christians, help them to realize their tremendous and overwhelming responsibility to pray. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
little thing related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible I want to let you know that I am with you And I will be forever Every little thing related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible I want to let you know that I am with you And I will be forever When you talk, I want to listen to you for hours When you are there beside me I feel like looking at you all the time Make me smile I know you are doing hard work To make things possible I want to let you know That I am with you And I will be forever
Do it.